most important thing I can say today. Why, after this massive generation peaked in spending and should have caused a long-term slowdown from 2008 to 2022, 23, that's right up till recently, just like it did from 69 to 82 in the previous generation and 29 to 42 in the one before that. Why didn't that happen? It's because governments did realize they, for the first time, central banks could print enough money <laughs> to just cover it over. What, what would have been another kind of great long-term depression with, and I, I'm the only guy that'll tell you this number, $27 trillion since 2008. Nine of that was, 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 was money printing, just printing money out of thin air, injecting in the economy, and 19 of it was running unprecedented in large 15 years straight of deficits. <laughs> Governments are supposed to run deficits in bad time and surpluses to make form and balance that. So, so Kai, this has never happened before. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the JR Mining Guy over on X and the host of this channel and I'm really looking forward to welcoming a first time guest. It's Harry Dent, really excited about uh, that he found the time to join us here and uh, quite quite appreciative of it because uh, he's a well-known quantity in the US and forecasting you know the economy and where things are headed. He's a financial author and newsletter writer over at harrydent.com and uh, really looking forward to discussing with him the, the latest Fed moves, the, the state of the economy, and uh, go, going to get his view and take on gold as well. Be prepared. It, it might be controversial for some of our regular viewers, so I'm quite curious uh, what, what you think about it in the comments down below. Please leave us a note. And uh, if you haven't done so, hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, reach a wider audience, and help educate more investors on the globe. So without much further ado, Harry, it is a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for making the time. Welcome to Soar Financially. Yeah, nice to be on. Yeah, Harry, he's like, yeah, let, let, let's dive right in. We have lots to discuss and very little time to do so. And uh, let, let's start with a bit of a general question because it's your first time on the program as well. Let's, let's see where your head is at and what you're thinking. But uh, what, what is the state of the economy? Where are we at right now? Okay, you know, first of all, we saw the baby boom generation caused the greatest boom in history from 1983 through 2007. Okay. Everything was easy then. We didn't have to have all these massive stimulus programs. And if we had a recession or a crash in the market, it didn't last long. Like 87 came right back to new highs, 2000, 2002, 2007, 8. You know, so, but that's because we had favorable conditions. And I was one of the few people in the world that saw that all the way back to the early to mid 80s when they were just coming in. Because I, I was working with new ventures who were dealing with younger baby boom clients and, and, and customers in new emerging markets. And so I had to study their customers, which were the baby boomers. And that's when I got the bright idea economically. Oh my gosh, nobody's looking at the impact of this unusually large generation. And by the way, if I go back historically, generations of this magnitude come about every 250 years. And that's when you see major revolutions and major bull markets and stuff to follow and all. So, so I was first to pick up on that, but that did peak in 2007, right on schedule. I was even shocked. I mean, I was saying late 2007, a long-term peak in the market way back even in the 80s, okay? Um, and so 2008, we go in this deep recession, which looked more like 1930, and Ben Bernanke was the Fed chairman then, and Ben Bernanke's thesis was the Great Depression, his PhD thesis. So he saw it the same way I did. He was like, oh my gosh, this looks like 1930. And so they just stepped on the spigots and so did the EU, Mario Draghi. Mario Draghi told short traders in Europe, if you dare short this market, I will blow you out of the water with as much stimulus as they. In other words, he says, I will print unlimited amount of money to keep from having a crash here. So that was actually, folks, a new era in economics. People think, oh, they must have done this in the Great Depression, the 2932 crash. No, first of all, they didn't have massive stimulus in the roaring 20s. It was a natural bubble boom with very favorable immigrants uh, demographics back then and very favorable technology cycles with telephone, electricity and phones m rushing mainstream the first time. And then that bubble turned into a not a normal recession, but a Great Depression. So so one thing, folks, to remember here, if you look at history and see depressions instead of recessions and longer downturns, 
Depressions follow bubble booms and bubbles are rare. There would be no bubbles until the mid to late 90s in stocks and the early 2000s in, in real estate. That was the first bubbles since the roaring 20s, okay? And so we've been in this bubble economy. It keeps crashing, but what did happen here, starting in 2008, nine, for the first time in history, governments finally figured out, wait a minute, we have the power to combat this. And again, you think of a bunch of stimulus and money printing in the roaring 20s. No, I mean, in the Great Depression. No, they did have public works progress on a lag for 1934 forward. They did not do this money printing and massive stimulus and stuff, okay? So that's what's happened. Since, and, I, and here's an important thing to note, okay? The most important thing I can say today. Why, after this massive generation peaked in spending, and should have caused a long-term slowdown from 2008 to 2022, 23. That's right up till recently, just like it did from 69 to 82 in the previous generation and 29 to 42 in the one before that. Why didn't that happen? It's because governments did realize they, for the first time, central banks could print enough money <laughs> to just cover it over. And, and believe me, when the Fed printed the first trillion and Mario Draghi did similar in, in EU uh, in 2009, they thought that'd be it. Oh, the economy's just in a slump. We'll just wake it up. Well, it didn't because of what I was looking at. A, a large generation had peaked in spending and, the, and, and spending was going to slow for 12 to 14 years before it even picked up again. So what they did, they covered over what, what would have been another kind of great long-term depression with 20, and I, I'm the only guy that'll tell you this number, $27 trillion since 2008. Nine of that was, 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 was money printing, just printing money out of thin air, injecting in the economy. And 19 of it was running unprecedented in large 15 years straight of deficits. <laughs> Governments are supposed to run deficits in bad time and surpluses to make form and balance that. So, so Kai, this has never happened before. Now, so the question is, well, but the economy's done pretty good, been growing at two to three percent and, and stocks have made new highs beyond anything. If you'd have gone by my natural cycles before, stocks would have made their highs in 2007 and gone sideways until recently and just be starting to move into the millennial boom. So we've got the most <laughs> perverted, that's the best way to call it, economy in history because governments naively decided to stimulate at all costs to prevent a recession from getting worse in 2008, which they did. They cut that off. That would have gone into 2010, just trust me, from history and gone deeper. And, and then we would have had another crash in 2020 to 2022 before this was over. And the demographics with the millennials got positive and the economy could grow healthfully on its own again. But we didn't. Instead, we've lived on $27 trillion of stimulus. And hey, they just pulled back. OK, they just raised interest rates and they let the balance sheet that accumulated money printing. They go off two trillion. OK, but we're still in, in massive net stimulus. The balance sheet started at a trillion. It's just gone from nine down to seven. OK, and, and interest rates have just gone from zero forever, which is highly stimulative to five twenty five. And, they, and they, they're going to bring them back to about three percent or three hundred basis points, they call it. That's their goal here, to bring them back to normal slowly, okay? But we're still in stimulant mode. One of the reasons the economy hasn't dropped off as much as people think with this two trillion reduction in the balance sheet and, and five and a quarter basis rate hike is we're still, and we're still running huge deficits, which is the biggest part of the stimulus, and we're still net stimulus at, at 475, even if we go down to 400 basis points by the end of the year, which seems to be the plan. So. You have to look at the whole picture. How did we get here? Why is there what? Why did it? Why isn't people asking? Why did it take 27 trillion? Well, nobody's told them it took 27 trillion to keep this monster alive. But why did it take that? And why do people think we can keep just printing our way into prosperity? The, the, the chickens will come home to roost in this. I think it's going to happen in the next two years, Kai. No. Hey, Harry, I've taken a zillion notes that we need to follow up on here, just on your opening statement here alone. But uh, maybe the new normal is maybe one of the first things you mentioned, 3%, more QT, meaning quantitative tightening, maybe reducing that balance sheet. What I got stuck on is the new term new normal. 
And uh, I'm quite confused by the 3% because back in the day, like 8%, 9% was normal. Even 10% back in the 70s when you took out a mortgage, it was 10%, 12%, yep. and nobody bat an eyelid about it, right? Yeah, why, why do you say bonds were yielding 14% at the top in 1980. Yeah. But, but again, that also, people used to say back then, it's the government deficits causing inflation. No. Our government deficits in a low inflation environment have, have outstripped those by far. It was the baby boom generation entering the workforce. It cost a lot of money to raise those kids by the parents. It cost a lot of money for businesses to incorporate and train them at first. They don't pay off from day one. Sorry. It actually takes about three years to break even on a new worker. OK, and, and then governments, you know, all, all of this stuff, government that caused these ma the massive inflation but it was mainly the baby boom entering the workforce i have one indicator that is all and gone back decades always been accurate on inflation until this massive stimulus workforce growth okay new and that means young people coming in is inflationary but that also means and now we have the retirement of the baby boom older people leaving is more disinflationary or deflationary if it gets so far so no economist on earth would tell you the biggest single cause of inflation is workforce growth. And that is what it is. And I'll tell you why, Todd. I wasn't a, a, an economist, okay? Mm -hmm. I took like an I majored in economics and quit after the third course because it was vague and conceptual and hard to apply, you know? And nobody can understand it. Even economists don't understand it. And economists have been the worst people to predicting the economy, especially long term, okay? So that's when I started doing my own research. And I was working with these small businesses, turning them around in the 80s. They were growing and small businesses always overexpand and crash. And so I was a turnaround manager, but I was doing my research on the side. And that's where I stumbled on, oh my gosh, there's no, no mystery of why the economy grows. People to enter the workforce at 20 after being a liability to the whole economy, including their parents, and start earning money and spending like crazy. And that happens from 20 to on average to precisely 46. No, not everybody, but that those averages are solid numbers. And now it's only moved to 47 for the peak in spending. So, so what I learned in that research is the economy is predictable if we look not at government policies, which, which are hard to change. I don't care who gets elected, Kamala or, 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 or Trump. They're not going to be able to make but so much change in an economy, especially if it gets in, 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 in trouble and stuff. It, you know, so it, it's this is what really causes long-term growth. And we can project this. If once somebody's born, we know they're going to enter the workforce at 20 and become productive and then spend the most money at 46 and then save and invest the most money at 63. These are precise numbers and they've held up over time and they only go, look, we can project booms and busts and inflation and disinflation and deflation over the rest of any of our lifetimes and maybe even our kids. That's, that's been my view. And people think I'm crazy because of that. But it's not. You have to get at the simplicity um, to, 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 to understand complexity. I don't care how complex something is. The paradox is everything's all so simple from people to our economy, 46 year lag for the peak spending is the, is the best indicator I ever discovered. And it's simple and I could explain it to a damn 10 year old. Okay. No, Harry, that's really elaborate. And, uh, I didn't expect to take the conversation that would down the road. I'm going to take it now with you because, uh, New, new technology and advancement of new technology. And one of my favorite well, sayings these days is this time is different. But with the advancement of AI, maybe product productivity growth, do we need less workers? Like, what, what does that look like? And uh, how do you factor that into your forecasts here, Harry? That, that, that's the best question you get to ask, Kai. That's the biggest misunderstanding that most people have. Oh, these new technology. Oh, but they're going to eliminate workers. <laughs> what? OK, so, so we shouldn't have had automobiles and electricity, you know, and we shouldn't have had microcomputers and now personal computers. No, this is this is absurd. Of course, they displace old industry. They create better, more productive new industries every time. When the Japanese started taking market share in all of our steel and automotive and type of industries, I was saying this is bullish, folks. They're taking the old granny industries and we're leading all the new high tech and baby boom generated, you know, new markets and industries. We are not, Japan is not gonna surpass us. We are not gonna become number two to Japan and be bowing down to East Asia, okay? And we still aren't here later because we excel 
And we, we have California in our country, which has Hollywood entertainment and technological high tech innovation <laughs> in the world and still does. And there's going to be more competitors and we're going to lose our edge slowly. But that's what's kept us going. The other thing is, yes, our population's aging. Yes, it's slowing growth. Slowing, but we had this baby boom coming in the 80s. I mean, this this pessimism, I was facing it from day one early mid eighties, when I started saying we could see a Dow at 10,000 by 2000 and the greater boom would go much higher than that could be 20, 30,000 by 2007 until they, people thought I was crazy. The Dow hit 12,500 by 2000 when people thought 10,000 was not even a possibility. So that's the power of being able to take something complex and say, okay, what's the simplest driving indicator and I came to the conclusion back then there was two, and you just touched on the second one. One is these generational surges in spending and it's and worker productivity, it's supply and demand expanding at the same time. More consumer spending, but the same workers who are spending are making things more productive as they're learning on the job in their cycle into their 40s and stuff. Okay. The other one is a technology, and that happens every 39 years, okay, to be precise. 29, 68, 2007 peaks and booms exactly 39 years apart on this predictable demographic side. The other one is technology and innovation. What you, and that I found, I used to think it was on the same generational clock and I kept digging, nope, didn't quite correlate, 45 year cycle. Within that cycle, you get a radical innovation surge like personal computers and then an extension, a maturity surge called like the internet. That happens, two booms, on a 45 year cycle. So what did we see in the tech markets and these bubbles? And that's where the bubbles come from, this 45 year cycle. The first tech cycle peaked in 2000 in a bubble from 95 to 99 in stock, early 2000 in stock and crashed 78%, even though we barely had a recession and the demographics were keeping the economy soaring, okay? Second bubble, right just recently, late 2021. And then that's been crashing, but all this stimulus has kept things kind of at bay for now, I say we still have that second major crash from the demographic slowing, but now this the only cycle that's been positive in the late 2021 was this 45 year technology cycle. And now it's gonna be negative all the way into 2032. So those are, these are the two things that drive our economy long-term. There's also a geopolitical cycle, but I don't, I'm not gonna get that today. That just affects valuations and people's optimism. The real economic growth comes from these two cycles almost exclusively. And I can project these two cycles for you, your grandparents, or your kids over the rest of any of their lifetimes. That's how powerful this is. So at least you know where things are going overall. My problem now is the government decided they were not going to accept the recession, which was a depression, as Ben Bernanke saw it, starting in 2008. And they've just blown their way out of it. And, and again, no apparent consequences so far. I say to people, I think these, these chickens are going to come home to roost in the next few years. And we're going to have a crash that should have occurred 2020 to 22 or 23, probably into late 2024 to 26 or seven. And then we will see the millennial boom. But, but I, from, from day one, Kai, and all my books are going to look back. The millennial boom, as much as everybody said, there's more millennials than baby boomers. They're a bigger generation. Yes, but they're spread out over a longer period of time and their relative growth as a wave is never as big as the baby boom. Our, our economy will never see a decade like the 90s again. That was the best decade ever. And you know what? I'd be best at advising presidents when to run. Bill Clinton walked into a decade he couldn't have screwed up if he had to. And I'm not saying he did. He didn't. I'm just saying that decade would have been great with or without him. Ronald Reagan walked into a deep recession in the early 80s, which I think the new president is going to face here. So an outsider is going to be in it, but it should be booming by the time um, um, the next election comes after this. And that's what happened to Reagan. He came into a downturn, 80, 80, you know, 80 to 82. And then by 84, the next election, the things were soaring and he looked like he turned around the worst downturn in history since the Great Depression. He was a shoe in for reelection. So, for, so this affects politics. The difference between me, Kai, I don't care who gets elected. The politics doesn't matter that much. If it did, I would study it more. But but I would be good at advising presidents and people mm -hmm. when to run or not. Whoever so the wins, especially uh, the uh, the outsider, if Trump wins it, because Kamala is a bit, is, uh, 
Kamala's going to get blamed for this downturn. Trump would. I was going to say, it's like the next president, it's it's an unthankful role. Like you have to catch the falling knife and you only have four years to fix it. Like Trump has right. four years, Kamala might have eight, but uh, that that's it. Like that, but, 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 that's not though, enough time. In state, though, no doubt the, the 29 to 32 was the biggest, deepest, 25% unemployment, 89% stock rate, the biggest crash ever. And it was over in less than three years. So even if, if I'm right and this thing starts later this year, early next year, it will be over and come screaming out of it by the time whoever gets elected gets reelected. I'm just saying it's the biggest plus for an outsider like Trump if he gets elected here, which it does not look like it to me. But if he did, he would not. You can't blame somebody coming new from the outside for a recession that just started when, when you came into office. And Reagan was not blamed for that. Franklin Delano Roosevelt came in <laughs> after the bottom. He wasn't blamed for the Great Depression. And he looked like the guy that turned it around, too. So this is an ideal. Uh, this election, I don't pay a lot of attention. This election is important to whoever gets elected because things should be better on the far end. And, and, and again, it would be, it'd be a big plus for Trump coming in. He'd be crowing about this so long, I'd have to move farther away than Puerto Rico to get away from <laughs> Yeah. Harry, you just mentioned you're expecting a bit of a crash market turmoil by the end of the year. And I want to work out some of the indicators you're looking for and and, and maybe hone down on timing. I know I don't want an exact day, by the way, but uh, it's more like what, what should we be looking out for? Like, what are some of the indicators, some, some of the crash signals? Like, have we chewed through the whole twenty seven trillion dollar pig already? Has that Python completely swallowed it? And the question is, what, what does it look like on the other end? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of indicators. Again, this has been so perverted. A lot of indicators don't work so well. What I did was I looked at every bubble since, you know, the stock started in the late 1700s. And, and the thing about the, the, what you look for when a bubble crash, the average bubble crash is 41% down in, 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 in a matter of three to six months. So, so it's the first crash that tells you, and, and actually 2022 looked close to that it was barely that but that's what i'd be looking at i think we are far i think they push this bubble as long as they can by overstimulating in covid which was a short-term crisis so i think i think the fed as much as they've been overstimulating forever and getting away with it i think where they blew it was overreacting to covid which would have gone away just like the influenza of 1918 to 20 almost exact same time schedule affects the economy for two years and then goes away on its own okay so if they, they put 11 trillion of this 27 trillion over the last 15 years came in those two years after COVID, okay? So that's what caused this sudden 9% inflation, which was way off. Inflation is gonna be low as far as the eye can see by my indicators. And my indicators have been right if it weren't for this 27 trillion short-term thing, okay? So they overstimulated, now they've had to over tighten. So this is the time that if we're going to see a first a bubble crash finally happen after a 15 year bubble instead of nine, five, six, it should show itself in this first crash by being unusually sharp and hard. We see at least about a 40 percent crash between 30 and 50. And it should happen within six to 12 months. If we see that, then I would say that's confirmation that this bubble has peaked long term and it's just not just another bubble peak on the way up to new highs. So it's so the problem for investors, we're going to have to wait to see. I say what you got to be now. I hate to say it. You got to trust people like me who, who don't owe anybody or not going to embarrass Merrill Lynch that I work for anybody. By saying, Listen to people warning. Look, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. We had the greatest bull market, even when we didn't deserve it. Take your chips off the table here and just give it six to 12 months to see if this thing starts to crash out now that it's been stretched so long. So, so to me, just the shape of this thing tells me this thing looks like it's getting ready to top. I used to could say, well, the demographics are going to slow and that's going to get precipitated down. No, this bubble's on only going to blow from its own excesses. And the fact that this tightening is still going to hit into the first quarter of next year. We have not felt the full of the tightening is not affected as much as people expected. But I warn them, we won't know till the first quarter how much this is really affected because you have to lag it by about one and a half years and, and it may even be longer now. So, so that's the dilemma now. So I say, be safe now, give the economy about six months into the first quarter of next year. If we're still just kind of going sideways or chugging along, going up a little bit, maybe I'm wrong and maybe they figured out a way that the economy never goes down again, which I still say not going to not a chance in hell, but Hey, 
I could be wrong with that. But give it that long. Be safe here. And you know what the safe place to be? 10 and 30 year treasury bonds. And there's a T, a, T, a, an ETF called TLT, which is an average of those 20 year average. That went up. Only thing that went up at the worst of the crisis in 2008, when gold even went down 45% short term, only short term. If everything crashes again, that will be your safe haven. If, thing, if, this, if this next first crash happens, that will do well while everything else, stocks and real estate and everything else you own starts to go down. That's the way to do. And if it starts next year and the crash looks that sharp, then you stay out for two to three years and you stay in these treasury bonds. And when they see they, they exploded in the second half of 2008, that was the first warning signal that, the, that we we're getting ready to turn around in early 2009. The bonds gave that ahead of stock. So I'm really tracking. I've been tracking the bond markets. They've been saying a top is coming ahead of stocks. And, and when we have this crash, when these treasury bonds you're holding and making money, remember, making money when everything else, real estate, stock markets, most other investments, commodities included, and even gold down the road is going down. These treasury bonds will be going up. And when you see them explode, that's when you're towards the end. That's the best way to gauge. We're near, not at, but near the end of the downturn. And that's, that's probably going to be a couple of years from now. But, but that's, these treasury bonds are, are a very important gauge. And I focus a lot on that in my newsletter that stocks, stocks will never tell you before they go down. They're just happy, happy, drunk, happy, party, happy until they hit the floor. Yeah, that, it's that one press release or that one uh, quarterly earnings report that just tanks everything and then the algos take over. You're absolutely right. That's one of the reasons I personally don't like the blue chip stocks like as, as an investment. Like that's, But that's personal preference for me. Um, you you well, answered yeah, probably my... Good point, real quick. Who piles in them? The everyday person's buying, not the smart money. The, the dumber money is piling at the end and they only buy those large cap blue cap stocks. So they're the worst thing to own at the end. Yeah. Well, I'm extremely dumb money because I play engineer mining, right? So that's where a lot of my money is. But um, you you answered my next three questions, but I'm going to follow up with one. You you mentioned people should park out, park their cash right now in like TLT or in, in bonds. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at the bond returns here and the 10 years yielding about 3.75%. And I have to ask you about uh, real returns and uh, real rates versus inflation, meaning 3.75% versus CPI. What yeah, is it, 2.9%? A treasury bond will always pay you. It's the safest in long-term investment in the world. So it's not going to pay. You're not taking much risk, okay? So it's going to pay you 1 to 2 points, 1 to 2% above the inflation rate. That's why they took, that's not what we're looking for here. I'm saying being treasury bond, hey, nothing wrong with 4% when things are uncertain. I'm saying being them because they've already proven in modern times, not way back in the last crash in this bubble era we've been in since 1995, that in a crash, it's the treasury bonds that end up being the safe haven. And it is not gold, Peter Schiff, okay? <laughs> gold holds up in the early stages, but it goes down with everything else. So it's the only thing that went up. So this, we're buying these because not for the 3 to 4% interest. That's nothing, okay? But it doesn't hurt. But we're buying them because they'll explode as a safe haven when there's nothing else to run to because stocks and real estate and commodities and gold and everything else is failing at the same time. And that's what happened, especially in the second half of 2008. And that's when the Treasury bond said, we're the last game, folks. It's us or cash. And that's when the bonds went up the most in three months in their entire history. That's what I'm looking for. That's what the Treasury bonds are for. And you get paid 4%, 3 to 4% while you're holding, great. That's not what we're looking at. Loving this discussion, Harry. It's like one thing like I'm taking away is that you really don't mind like making a bit of a loss potentially on the cash because the real inter uh, the real CPI or the perceived inflation doesn't really matter because you get paid 4% regardless. Yes, you might lose a couple percent on, on the perceived inflation, but you're willing to take that risk because you get guaranteed payouts. Is that, uh, yeah, is that again, correct? Cash, if you just in cash, when, when you have an, a, a bubble birth, an everything bubble, and that is an appropriate term that's been thrown around now. This is an everything bubble. Even 29, real estate didn't bubble like stock because it was too hard to finance real estate back then, okay? So when you have an everything bubble, just cash, you're saying, well, I'm making nothing in my cash, but no, everything is going down so you can buy everything at 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% off. That cash is worth more. But the only thing better than cash is, is a long-term treasury bond that leverages that low-risk position 
and of over 30 years. So you get a magnified move. And again, my projection, and we've been telling people to buy the treasury bonds at 87 to 92. That was two areas we say, look, here's places where you want to buy this stuff. My projection has been they're going to go to at least 186. That's a doubling in two to three years on the safest, normally low risk, low return investment in history. And you could double your money when everything else is falling, which doubles the value of that because <laughs> anything else you would have lost instead of gaining. So this is a, a once in a lifetime. We, we have never seen Treasury bonds do what I'm saying in the past, even the Great Depression, although they did great then. Um, and we will never see it in the future. This is a once in a life opportunity to double your money in two to three years in one of the safest, lowest risk investments in the world. In other words, if this doesn't happen, you're still getting paid three to four percent interest on something that's very safe otherwise. You'd have you to have probably... hyperinflation to kill these bonds. And, and with all this deflationary, you know, reducing the balance sheet, you know, all this thing, everything, you know, to, to, to slow the economy, how are you gonna have hyperinflation? Not even like Peter Schiff's preaching hyperinflation out of this. That is what there's not a chance at hell about. Oh, I need to host a debate between the you two, the two of you. That'd be good entertainment, I think, for everybody. Well, both but um, Rico, by the way, we're not that far from each other. <laughs> Maybe we might have to do that in person. I could use some sun, to be honest. So, um, but you probably can get us my next question because I'm trying to do across all uh, all the T's and dot the I's here. We have to talk the U.S. debt situation. Is there any worry that the U.S. will go insolvent at one point? It won't be able to service that debt and uh, service and pay your interest. No. Zero risk. And that's why the Treasury bonds are it. Other governments are not the same. OK, the U.S. Look, look at look at how the deficit we've run <laughs> unprecedented 15 trillion. And, and our Treasury bonds are still selling at, at very affordable rates above, above above the inflation rate. The government's still able. The government can't afford to ever. And I mean, ever, ever, ever default on these damn bonds. And you know what? they The reason they won't when corporations and other governments will. They have a printing press. So short term, they can print money to cover these, even if it hurts the dollar a little bit. That doesn't matter. They can't forget the dollar even. They can't let these treasury bonds fail because it's the, it's the way they have been able to get through this crisis and still sell money to cover their deficit. And they're going to see, you think they got deficits now? They're going to have bigger deficits. They need that treasury bond to be solid as gold. They will never ever default and they don't have to because again a corporation can't print money if they get in trouble if they get in trouble and turn around and sell stock or sell bonds they're gonna have to pay a humongous premium because they're in trouble okay u.s government can be in trouble and still and they are in trouble and have you and still sell these bonds for three and a half percent a day oh my god that's a huge opportunity and, and that's why they they will not let these things don't even worry about these things default yeah, from what I'm reading, the bonds not about are... any other bond on earth. A few maybe, but, but none in this case. The U.S. government in particular cannot not pay these bonds principal and interest. Yeah. Selling like sliced bread, quite honestly. I've been trying to find some articles on whether the bond auctions are choking, whether there's anything like that's slowing them down, or whether the Fed has to pick up the slack. Very little A, there's very little news on that. And B, so far I can't find anything yeah, or any indication. If the yield just goes up, it's some yield. If it goes up a half a point, people will jump in for the risk. Yeah. And like you say, yeah, we we people would have said 20 years ago if the government ran this level of deficits, you know, nine trillion, you know, or whatever over 15 years, that, that we wouldn't be able to float bonds. No, wrong. We're still the best how, and this is the most important statement I can make. As bad as we are, Europe's got much higher debt ratios. Japan off the charts have been doing this for a long time, print, living off printed money. We're still the best house in a bad neighborhood, and our safest bonds, therefore, become the safest, best bonds in the world. That's why you buy them in a crisis, and that's why you sell them. People saying, well, Harry, I'm buying a 30-year bond. I can't hold it for 30 years. I'm not telling you to hold it for 30 years. I'm telling you to hold it for the next two years plus in a crisis. And I'm going to tell you to sell those. And then you get back in stocks and real estate when they're fairly valued for the first time in 20, 30 years. In the, in the same breath, and just to follow up on what you just mentioned, Harry, is like the U.S. dollar, you're not worried about the U.S. dollar as a currency at all either no. in that regard, right? Guess so it's the, the same US thing. Dollar did in, in 2008. Up. Treasury bonds and U.S. I left that out. And U.S. dollar went up 
in the crisis. Why? We're the best. I don't care how screwed up we are. We're the best house in a bad neighborhood for the developed world. No, and no as I said, just the emerging world in a global crisis. They're always the, they're like the small cap stocks. They go up the most. They go down the most. They, they, so so it's, so the U.S. dollar <laughs> and our treasury bonds are the safe yeah. haven. If somebody tells you to run to gold, I say, hey, have a little bit, okay, if you want. There is no way in hell if what I say happened, we have this big crash, gold's going to be the safe haven. Because 2008, I, I'm predicting this is going to be, here's, here's my rule, 1.5x. The stock crash, the recession and unemployment, everything's going to be 50% worse this time. This is the last downturn we need to clear all the excesses from the great baby boom era and the greatest bubble boom in history and all these bubbles. And, and by the way, we will never see bubbles, any of us or our kids, for the rest of our lifetime. They are rare, okay? But we have to flush them out. They're still going because we're still feeding the monster with this $27 trillion, which nobody talked about. $27 trillion, okay? So if you say, well, Harry, the economy's okay. Well, if it costs 27 trillion, do you think that's 9% a year, by the way, over that time period, you're gonna spend 9% to grow two to 3% in the economy and you think that's a good deal? It may have avoided a recession or a depression, but it's still a bad deal. It's still a huge, horrible investment. And we're gonna pay for this, whether slowly over time or a big crash. And you know what I want? I want the big crash take a big dump and get it out of the way. That, that's my view. I don't want to suffer this in this high debt ratios forever. This, and they weigh down any economy, any company, okay? We can flush out, mo and it's not the government debt's going to go away. It's all the private debt is three to one to government debt. Private debt around the world is going to disappear in massive amounts and take a huge load off the economy. So it's not just the millennial demographics driving us again instead of the baby boomers, we have a much healthier, lower debt economy to profit from it more so. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking of the economy, <laughs> all you got to do is get out of the way. I'm telling you, I can't stop this. You can't stop this. Peter Schiff can't stop it. All you have to do is get out of the way, be in cash if you're really confused, be in long-term treasury bonds if you're really smart, because most people are going to listen to Peter Schiff and buy gold and get their ass kicked at least <laughs> partially there. No. What, what I'm hearing, Harry, is, is you're absolutely fine with the market taking care of this problem. Yeah. Let's call it that. That's uh, what, that's the market taking care of this, right? We found out the best thing that's made us rich in history. <laughs> this is not free market capitalism no. when the government decides what interest rates are. And they actually affect the long-term rates way more by all this. Man, they're, they're working on the long-term rates even more than the short-term rates. This is not free market capitalism. So unless you think Ben Bernanke and all these Fed chairmen, Jerome Powell, Powell, are smarter than the whole entire free markets that have made us rich, who are you going to bet on? These guys never had sex or run a business. And they're determining the economy. Who are you going to trust? I say free market capitalism. We have thrown it under the bus. And if this crash, this crash is going to have to go down enough to get people to see it wasn't worth it. The, the free money was not free. We got the biggest ass kicking since 29 to 32. That's not free. It looks like it's free. It looks like it's working now. That's why I want this crash to happen, to, to get people back in reality and to prove that you can't live on printed money and we can go back to a real economy. We have not had a real economy since 2008. I'm, I'm trying to end this on a positive note here, and it, it's really difficult because there, there's a crash looming. There's no doubt about it. I, I fully agree. You double your money in a downturn and buy everything at 50 to 80 percent off. <laughs> that, if you want more positive note than that, then find it. You won't find it anywhere. No. But you got to get out of the way. All you have to do is get out of the way, give up some short term gains potentially to be able to profit that. If you stay and wait to see if I'm right, you'll be down so much you won't even be able to benefit from it much. No, no, that's the perfect note to end on. No, I appreciate that. So I don't even have to ask you another question about China stimulus packages and all that that we're seeing in the market today. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. Phenomenal discussion, Harry. Really appreciate well, your time. By the we're, way, we're... who's the biggest bubble in the world? China. China's going to go down. I feel very sorry for the Chinese people. They've been duped and you can't go wrong buying they, they real estate. They keep pumping air. A lot of them have one or two empty homes on top of their little dinky home. They have, they're going to get crucified. They have 75% of the net worth in real estate. Their real estate bubble is going to go down way more than ours. Ours might be 50 to 60%, and that's crucifying. 
theirs is going to be 70 to 80 percent and that is death defying yeah, they're just pumping more air into the bubble today as we speak. So that's there exactly you. what's happening. Harry, where can we find more of your work? Harrydent.com. I have a paid newsletter people want to get on, and I'd say this is the best time of that. But if you want to get to know us better, just go to harrydent.com. You can get on our free newsletter. You're going to get an article from me every week and two video rants a month for free to get to know us. Phenomenal. Harry, it was a great pleasure having you on the program. And we need to catch up in January, see how things are playing out and where we're at. Of course, post-election and then perhaps we're already at the beginning of that crash phase that you've mentioned. So also, by the way, I'm sure you must be a big fan of the fourth turning um, by Neil oh, Howe. We love those guys. They did politically and socially what I did economically and financially. Understand how important generation cycles. They're not only different in size, but they're different in personality yeah. and, and how they react. So I love those guys. No, we had Neil on about six months ago, I think. So phenomenal interview with him as well. And uh, it really correlates, as you said, like it, it complements each other, your, your two theories. Yeah. So thank you so much, Harry, and to really appreciate your time and to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. Tremendously appreciate your support by hitting that subscribe button. Leave a comment down below. How are you positioning? Are you willing to give up short-term gains for long-term wealth? Really curious what your thoughts are. Put them down below. We do want to hear from you. Share this interview with your friends because we want to educate. And it doesn't matter if you have the same opinion. We want to educate. You need to hear both sides and we want to... We want to help you be a better investor. It doesn't matter which way you invest, where you invest, and what you do. This is not financial advice. We're just trying to educate. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more. Bye.